There are many things that you should know when buying a property to protect yourself from past sellers' unpaid debts and claims of ownership, like your neighbor saying that part of your property is theirs. In other words, you need to make sure you're buying your home with a clear title or deed. To make sure of this when you're buying a home, you'll be using a title company. In this video, I'm talking with title company owner David Thurston, a real estate attorney, to share his advice on preventing common pitfalls when buying a home. We also talk about the 2008 crisis a little bit and what he's seeing with home purchasing today. I hope you enjoy the show. All right, Dave, thanks so much, man, for meeting me and telling all the buyers out there what they need to make sure that they do to protect themselves in a home purchase. So please tell everyone a little bit about yourself and we'll dive in. Yeah, so Dave Thurston, I'm a real estate attorney. I own a company called Crown Title, which is a nationwide provider of settlement services and we insure title nationwide. You know, Dave, you and I, we've known each other for quite a bit of time and you, you help a lot of my clients and myself as well uh, in the transaction. So I really trust your you know your advice um what are you seeing out there before we dive in really into the title aspect you know kind of tell everyone you know what is it that you're seeing are you seeing a big slowdown certainly seeing a slowdown i think in the northeast states there's not a lot of new home building and the supply uh, of people selling existing homes is very poor it's, it's in some cases one tenth of what it was pre-pandemic in areas of development, you know, Nashville and uh, certain parts of Texas, certain parts of Florida, where there is some home building going on, those prices are starting to to suppress a little bit. Yeah, and so just tell everybody, how many states do you serve? So we're directly, we can serve all 50. We're directly licensed uh, to issue title insurance in 35. Gotcha. So, I mean, that's that's a big territory. So you're really yeah. keeping a, you know, a pulse on what's going on. You know, um, during the the big run you know from geez i'd say mid 2020 when we realized that money was being printed and that uh people turned to buying homes instead of working in some cases they had jobs but they were just not doing them you experienced where and i mean we both experienced it but where people were paying ridiculous prices over praise value uh, but you also saw a lot of cash transactions and um, you saw a lot of money from mom and dad. We were watching, you know, parents yeah. putting massive amounts of money down for these, uh, for their kids to be able to even buy a home. Are you seeing a whole lot of that still? St still seeing it. I, I think that really most young first time home buyers really need some help from a source. And then I, I think the bigger trend, and you know, you were home builder for years and still know the industry very well. Uh, multi-generational families in the same home is really starting to take off. Yeah, that's true. I've, I've had a, my last couple listings were actually that where people were buying it for mom and dad or the grandparents to move in. And yeah, definitely. Or the kids, right. Moving back in. Um, how about contract cancellations? I mean, they're, they're talking about now nationwide over 16% of the contracts or buyers are just walking away. Uh, I think the highest state in the country is said to be Atlanta, Georgia, city and state. Um, I think here we've seen about 16 to 20 percent on the MLS where uh, houses have gone back on the market. That's how we know when contracts have been canceled, because we see that they're back out on the market again. Um, are you finding this to be a big uptick in I think, cancellations? I think those numbers are right on. I think pre uh Pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, we were well under 10% on contract cancellations. We're 20 right now in our residential department. And what are you seeing the reason being? I, I think we had a little bit of a sticker shock as rates moved, I think, quicker, upward quicker than anybody thought. And there was a, a, a intake up about 30 days ago. And I think people were pre-qualified at one rate, had to go lock a second rate. And I think that that did a lot of it and then now i think buyers are starting to regain some of the power in the market so you are seeing inspections and you're seeing inspections to where contracts can be renegotiated and as you know it's expensive to rehab and repair homes now and i think the sellers get in a situation where an inspection comes back that's not great too much to fix and then the buyers walk away 
You know, Dave, I'm and you're an attorney, so I'm going to ask you this question and um, can't wait for your response. But, uh, you know, a contract is a contract. I mean, you, you look at um, it says contract to sale right at the top of it. Right. And if you don't understand what you're signing, you should seek competent legal advice right from an attorney like you. But I have seen where the agents have called me up even personally and said, I'm sending you over release. We've gone through everything. We've, you know, we have their pre-approvals. We have uh, the inspections out of the way. We've negotiated the inspections and the repairs. And then all of a sudden the agent calls up and says, hey, by the way, um, I'm sending a release. We're walking away. The buyer's walking away. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Like we're, we're in a contract. And they're saying basically tough. Is the contract really not worth anything nowadays well i think it's worth something if you want to spend the time to litigate it you know it's very interesting i was talking to a, a colleague of mine and i said you know on the commercial side especially larger commercial deals these contracts frequently get renegotiated as it leads up to the ex expiration of due diligence it's just the common fact of how it works and but these are large 40 50 60 million dollar transactions on the residential side now it appears that the parties who signed the contract just think it's a starting point. And there's all these, they, 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 they bring in all these equitable arguments about why the contract should be modified or changed. But you know, as well as I do, it's the four corners of a contract. And the seller is under no responsibility to allow the buyer to renegotiate. Now the contingencies are the contingencies, whatever contingencies were in the original contract if you didn't put a financing contingency in there and the buyer doesn't qualify for the loan, that's a forfeiture of deposit. But is that it? I mean, is it so? And this is, I get this question a lot. If I'm a seller and my buyer walks away and we've gone through all the contingencies, clearly I think I've consulted with an attorney and I think that I would have a case at actually suing this buyer. Can I, as the seller, continue to market my home for sale as I'm pursuing this buyer that defaulted? Or is the only way for me to really be successful to experience the pain of not putting it on the market, keeping it off the market, and then showing more harm? I mean, what's kind of like the, what's the legality in this? In most cases, the seller can move forward. So how how the MAR contracts are written in Maryland, and every, every state's probably slightly different. There are liquidated damages and consequential damages. So from if the buyer defaults, normally the seller's remedy is to retain the deposit as liquidated damages, which means they cannot sue the buyer to mandate the purchase. Now on the buyer's rights, it's different. If the seller attempts to default, normally there are consequential and liquidated damages. Consequential meaning specific performance, buyer could sue the seller for specific performance. So they have different rights in the remedy. So if that buyer, so let's say, uh, uh, you know, the buyer in this case has a $5,000 deposit. And by the way, guys, I tell people all the time, be careful if you're buying how much money you put down. Because if you put down, a lot of agents will say, we'll show the sellers you're serious by putting down in excess of 1%. I always say 1% is a good amount. $500,000 house, $5,000 earnest money deposit, good faith deposit. But in a lot of cases, the agent, your buyer's agent will say, you know, hey, you should really show these sellers that you're serious and put down $15,000. What David's talking about here is that money really if the buyer decides because of whatever reason remorse or what have you if your state requires both the buyer and seller to sign a form that releases the deposit money should one of the parties should that seller not sign it you could be out a lot of money and be out of the market on buying a house but what you're saying dave is that if somebody puts down a five thousand dollar deposit and then they realize that they have remorse for whatever reason and they were to walk away if that seller takes that $5,000, that's remedy, that shuts it down. If they accept that, that they would not be subject to a further lawsuit. That is how the standard MAR contract is written. Okay. Uh, you should always check your contract okay. because different gotcha. brokers will use yeah. different provisions. But I think really, you know, we spend, and we, we, you and I were joking the other day about the length of these contracts now. 
the one thing that we don't spend a lot of time with is a what are the contingencies and b what are the what's the damage clause really mean if the contingency is not met yeah right? so they should focus on the damage yeah. clause yeah. what happens if there's a default exactly. from either party exactly gotcha all right so um you know uh foreclosures and I want everybody to understand um, you were really a big player in the the great financial crisis that we experienced in 2008. This was nationwide. And it, can you just tell everyone what your role was? I know you were big with foreclosures and bank repossessions. And in fact, you did a lot of work for HUD, right? So can you just to contextualize, you know, um, the next couple of questions that I have about the market and your prediction on the housing market, you know, what was your role back then and what did you experience? Yeah, so it's interesting. So from 2000, you know, all the way up to today, we've represented large servicers and there was time HUD, Fannie Mae, when they have to foreclose properties. So during the uh, the, the great uh, real estate uh, recession from, I mean, you want to call it maybe 07 to 11, maybe in that range, where prices were really going downhill. It, 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 there wasn't as many consumer protection laws on the books then. So they were more apt, the servicer was more apt to foreclose quick. And now they're, they're more, there's more of a, more of a, I guess, Bailouts? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to be delicate here. Uh, there's more of an appetite for them to modify loans, put the arrears on the end, recapitalize someone and give them a second chance without using the court systems for that. Most uh, states have judicial foreclosure, which means you have to involve a judge to get foreclosure. And, and here in Maryland, for example, you now have consumer protection laws which mandate face-to-face -face meetings between the servicer and the debtor. That n did not exist in 07, 08, 09, 2010. So what's really happening, at least in my practice, is if the debtor has passed away, if there's been a death of the person liable for the mortgage, they'll foreclose that pretty quickly. Uh, if the person's still alive, if they can get a job, they can get, they can prove, they can make a certain payment, they'll modify them and give them a second chance. Once they default a second time, then it goes into the, the normal foreclosure proceeding. But I think yeah. that's why less foreclosures are into the market now than what people had originally predicted. Yeah. Because there's more workouts. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the COVID money finally runs out that people have to start making their payments uh, that mm -hmm. were affected by, you know, that they said they were affected by COVID-19. As of November 1, I think all these payments are coming due. Well, it's interesting. We, we've talked about the macro economy a bunch uh, online and offline. But uh, the consumer, I think now it's it's at the end of October of 23 when we're here. But the consumer is finally feeling the pressure of the the Fed changes. I, I thought it would have happened, happened a lot sooner. But it appears now, if you look at the data, the consumer is getting beat up a lot. And I think that's... It took a little longer, but I think the hangover's here. Are you seeing where foreclosures are starting to pick up? Yes, but I don't think they're going to get to the level that, that most people predicted a year or two years ago. So are you preparing your company? I mean, I know, you know, you had basically call centers to handle, you know, the, yeah. the calls from the banks and, you know, trying to even help them work through, you know, their financial distress and navigate the foreclosure process. Are you preparing yourself at all your company for an uptick in foreclosures? We are, we are. So we're actually launching a, a technology company that's called CyberSign. I'm, I'm doing that here locally with a few other attorneys, Mark Wittstadt, Bob Flynn, I think you know those guys. Yeah. So CyberSign is gonna be basically a, a, re, a remote online notary uh, software package that's geared toward REO and large servicers. Yeah. So we're really excited about having that having that launch. I think that the servicers will be much more equipped to handle it now than they were 10, 12, 13 years ago. And certainly there's more compliance on their end to do that. Well, Dave, you were saying, you know, uh, back in the 08 crisis, we'll call it, 07 to 2011, 2012, we'll call it the 08 crisis. You had said that one of the reasons why so many people got foreclosed on was because they didn't have the consumer protections that they have now. However, 
it took them a long time to get these defaulting owners out of the home. In fact, I know in some cases where somebody stayed in the house for 10 years, didn't pay a penny, the uh, the bank had to pay for the taxes and for that 10-year period and insurance to make sure their asset was protected. And then they gave this particular person, I'm referring to, $20,000 or $25,000 cash for keys. How have things changed today that speeds the process up for a bank if they do foreclose to actually kick somebody out and you, you know um how does that vary from state so, to state yeah so, so i'll use maryland for an example most states have enacted a similar process at least most of the northeast states you know what the consumers complained about in the 08 crisis was they didn't have access to the servicer they left the message didn't get a call back they sent an email didn't get response so now there's actually a, 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 a arbitration slash mitigation meeting that every servicer must send an attorney or a manager and a manager has to be a decision making manager has to be available either face to face with the borrower or zoom remotely where if a decision's made to modify, correct, reduce, hmm. second chance, that decision maker has the is someone there. It, it doesn't go back to a loan committee or anything like that. So from that standpoint, it's made it's personalized the process more. And so they make a decision whether they're going to work something out with well, the borrower right Well, they basically right redo a borrower's application and to really see what his ratios would be and see if they can modify it in a way that, that, that the gentleman or the lady or the couple could, could pay, the, pay going forward. So it's really interesting now the, the, the consumer slash debtor has a seat at the table that with, with or without an attorney, they have a seat at the table. They can show up by themselves and just say, hey, this is what I can and cannot do. Um, so from that standpoint, it's made it more personalized. And then I think there is political pressure coming from the White House and from the CFPB for these servicers to modify. Hmm. So it's very seldom that the first default you're going to get foreclosed on. So when they just determine that the borrower's just not going to, you know, they've given them a chance, maybe that chance is now, maybe they've had one or two, you know, workouts since the beginning of the pandemic, 2020. I mean, what will be the process then for them to determine, nope, that's enough, and how quickly will they, will they proceed with a foreclosure? Once they decide, once the servicer decides, A, modify, B, foreclose, that foreclosure generally in most states has taken almost a year. And the consumer, in your example, would probably not, if, if it's if it's at the beginning of foreclosure, you're going to probably be in default. You're going to miss two payments, maybe almost a third, because of the way the 15-day grace period works. If you're 45 days down, they still wait 45 days to get you a letter in most cases. So by your 90 days down, they're going to get you a letter. From the date of that letter, you probably have a year in most Northeast states before you're you're through to foreclosure. But during that process, you have a right to meet with them face to face. And you can elect into arbitration, which we always advise consumers to elect into arbitration. And that way you get a face to face meeting with the servicer, with a decision maker, and see if you can't work something out. So they're really trying. They're trying to keep everybody in the houses, which is good. I mean, it's, you know, I think it's good, Dave, if it actually works and that people can get on their feet. I think, you know, like we've seen before, what happens is when people stop paying their mortgages, they stop fixing their house because they're like, yeah. do I hold on to this last little bit of money that I have or do I fix my home and they're going to take it anyway? And why would I want to fix up the house that they're going to end it's, up taking? You, you, know, you know, it's interesting too, Todd, in, in, in the past, and it'll be interesting to see how this, how we come through this little bump, this little recession we're going to have, but Auto loans used to be the lowest default because no matter what, people wanted to keep, they, they would default on their house and default on their credit cards, but they'd pay the car payment because they needed to get to work. They needed to get to grandma's house, whatever it was, right? It was a necessity. Now you're seeing that auto loans or defaults are way up. So I don't know if it's the Uber, <laughs> Lyft, you know, can you Uber and Lyft cheaper? Yeah. You can ride a car now. Who knows? But you know that's that's one thing that's scary is you're seeing when you when you're looking at what the consumers doing. Um, housing defaults are increasing, but they're not really, I think, 
off the charts high that people are shocked yet, but they are increasing. But car loan defaults are increasing. The amount of money rolling over month to month between credit cards and credit card defaults are increasing. Yeah, which means it will start seeing a pickup in bankruptcies. And you have yeah. the and you have the situation where the student debt has to be is coming back to be paid first quarter of 24, I believe. Yeah, well, they're supposed to start paying it now in October, but I think that Biden had put in a ramp up program that they could, yeah. you know, not have their credit affected um you know negatively if they you know they gives them another 12 months or whatever but yeah i mean obviously they are going to definitely need to pay their student loans i think and uh, but yeah all right so let's kind of talk about the title aspect what you do on besides the the legal work that and advising you know uh people through real estate transactions once a sale is negotiated and a lot of people don't know what a title company does, right? Um, they don't even know that they need one until the real estate agent says, yeah. well, who do you want for your title company? And they're like, what? Title company? I don't, no idea, especially first time buyers. But um, explain to everybody, like, what is a title? What is a real estate title? And what does it mean? Because when we transfer property, your job is to make sure that it's clear and marketable right but what is a title and what does it mean to be clear and marketable yeah so so basically how i look at it is from the time the contract signed if we're engaged to be the title company from the time it settles it's really a legal function and what we do is we'll send searchers to do a 60-year title search that's generally the standard any lien or issue that would come up during that time that's called an on record risk because we were able to send an experienced searcher to the courthouse and they identified the lien. Now, normally it is open taxes, open water bill, open mortgage. Maybe there's a right of way that supports the property, anything that would, would affect the value or the functionality of the property. We then resolve all those issues. If it's right of ways, we disclose them. If it's liens, we pay them off or we make sure they're gonna be collected and paid at the closing. So when the buyer gets the deed, when the, the, the legal document which conveys ownership from the seller to the buyer is called a warranty deed. When the buyer accepts that deed and puts the property in, in their own name, they need to make sure that all the prior liens have been resolved. Now sometimes it's not just your seller. It could be a seller from 10, 15, 20 years ago. So from that standpoint, our attorneys, our paralegals, our settlement officers, they resolve those problems. Then we have a settlement. Hopefully it's a great settlement. Everybody's happy. From that point on, really, it's a accounting function in that we have received all these funds in. We have a certain amount to spend. We expend the exact amount, paying the liens, giving the seller his cash out, recording the documents. But title insurance is very important, and this is why. There are on-record risk and there are off-record risk. And on-record risk is something that our searcher discovered. You can discover it, and you can deal with it. And off-record risk, it doesn't matter. You could take the 20 smartest real estate attorneys in the state. They can search that title, and they won't find if a deed was forged or if a lien was misindexed or an estate was probated wrong. There were five errors. They only notified four. All those off-record risks are why you buy the insurance. And you know, people sometimes, you know, they, they get a, a, a disclosure that it's optional. Sure, it's the lender always makes you buy it for them. What does that tell you? Yeah. Right? The owner says, well, if it's optional, I don't want it. Okay, but your 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 owner's policy is four hundred dollars. If one of these off record risks come forward, you're gonna pay an attorney five hundred dollars an hour to resolve it. Whereas if you have the policy, the title insurance company will appoint counsel. They'll resolve it on your behalf because it's part of the policy limits. And you only pay it one time. You only pay it one time. And it's not like a continual so, expense. So it's prudent to have it. I don't. I, I try to. Anybody needs to talk about it anytime. I'll talk about it when I buy. I buy it. It's just you can't. You shouldn't not buy real estate and yeah. not have it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what Dave's talking about here is not just the title work that they do, but they also title companies provide title insurance to make sure that uh, like he's saying if, if if there's a mistake that's made even in this transfer or prior transfers that if they don't pick it up then they cover it and you're covered with that insurance policy it's usually a couple thousand dollars for the buyer right yeah i mean it you know it's it's 
we have based simultaneous on sale price. we have simultaneous rates here in Maryland. So if the lender, you know, it's normally four dollars per thousand of the contract price, but that's split between the lender's policy and the owner's policy. Generally, depending on the down payment, the owner very seldom spending more than a thousand dollars for the policy. And there's a f- couple states, I guess, in the U.S. that mandate the yeah. the policy amount, right? Is yes. that because they're writing? Do the states actually write title insurance in these states? That, Some of them, like yeah. Iowa, has a has a uh, guaranteed fund, and the insurance is purchased through a guaranteed fund. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, one of my questions that I always have is, um, you know, why is it that the buyer is the one paying the title company? for the title work i mean you know when you look at a title company you don't really pick sides i mean you're a neutral party right i mean your job as a title attorney and a title company is to successfully bring these two together you know make sure that the the, both the seller is protected as well as the buyer in the transaction why does the buyer pay it yeah title companies generally take the position that we represent the contract so we're, we're really doing documents and preparing st- uh, closing statements and uh, legal documents that are a fair reflection of the contract and are standard documents that that particular state has accepted for years. So, you know, some states, the buyer picks the title company and they pay the, the cost. Some states, the seller picks the title company, the seller pays the cost. For us, operational wise, it's much easier if the seller picks because we're really vetting the seller. So the lender is vetting the buyer. Is he credit worthy? You know, what's his, what's his credit score? Those kind of things. We, we don't need any of that information. We're making sure the title's clear. In order to make sure the title's clear, we got to make sure the seller doesn't have any lien. So we're really working with the seller. However, in Maryland, it's which buyer. is our home market, it's a buyer, a buyer pick, a buyer pay. So it's a, it's a strange uh, dynamic. I really wish they would change it. I really wish they would go to where to sell her, a seller pay model everywhere because I think it's the the more accurate and fair reflection of how the transaction works. And then there's one little caveat to that. If the buyer is getting a loan, the lender makes a sign, closing instructions, which represent that we are representing them, issuing and short closing letter to them, and we're representing them with this transaction. Now, the buyer, as a byproduct of that, the buyer gets really representation for free in the fact that the lender goals and the buyer goals are the same. The lender only wants to lend on a property that's free and clear of liens and gets recorded timely. And the buyer only wants to own or accept the property that's free and clear of liens. So they sort so the buyer sort of by default gets the benefit of that representation. You know, a lot of people think with um, a title, and problems with the title has to do with finances, you know, where there's a lien, there's a hidden lien, there's an unpaid bill, and then all of a sudden it shows up one day. Maybe it's a, even a mechanics lien, right? Um, you know, from a seller that recently had work done on their property and they didn't pay their contractor. But there are a lot of other things that can be problems with a deed. Um, one of them is an encroachment. And I know you and I, man, mm-hmm. we've we've had some we've had some stories to share with encroachments but um how does a buyer you know when i look at it and, and and this is no dig on you or take no offense please to what i'm about to say but you know there's a lot of things that i feel that title companies don't tell or don't assure a buyer that they're protected you know, uh, and some of these, Dave, not just encroachments, but they're called um, easements or deed restrictions. And I want to kind of talk about those, but can you talk about encroachments, what they are, and how does a buyer protect themselves? Because you're not really doing much on that side. I think as an industry, I think you hit on something really important. I think as an industry, we do a very poor job communicating to consumers, A, what is title insurance and what does it cover and b the restrictions and uh, exceptions to their title for example if you're buying a residential piece of property right now and i run a title you would expect to see a utility easement because you need electricity you would expect to see a cable tv easement from the cable company because you want cable tv right you would 
you expect to see a water and sewer easement because you got to get water and sewer uh, in and out of the property. But over and above those typical exceptions, we don't do a great job sitting the consumer down and saying, hey, the neighbor has a right of way across the back 20 feet of your property. So if you're going to put a fence there, you're going to need, if you want, and you're going to put a fence in the right of way, you're going to need his authorization to do that. Those kind of things. And, you know, it's funny, the, the title insurers stop making, the title insurers about 20 years ago gave in the pressure from the local politicians not to make, no longer to mandate surveys being bought. So now the survey is optional. A lot of buyers waive the survey. And when they waive the survey, the encroachments don't necessarily, the location of the encroachment doesn't show up. You may know the document's recorded. We find it, we put it in the title policy as an exception, but it hasn't been located. We really don't have the ability to locate it. We can identify it, but not locate it. But how do you identify it? Identify because it's recorded in the land records. What if it's not? Well, if it's not, that's a different problem. That's an off-record risk, and that's a different problem. Right. right? And an example of that, it purely is a deal that we did together. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And, you know, and, and the situation was, you know, and when when somebody's buying a piece of property, it be should behoove them yeah. to look on GIS maps. At least look on At the a land minimum. records. At a minimum. At, right. At a minimum. And yeah. kind of see where the property lines are and see if any old photography, it doesn't mean that it's updated or current imagery right. in the GIS records. And uh, make sure that if it looks like the line goes through and the neighbor's building is on your property, potentially mm-hmm. it's something that you should maybe look into. And Dave, you and I had a deal that besides it being a multi-pronged problem and you were involved from the beginning uh, with the uh, with the deal, but it came down to, um, and this was a situation that we found out about uh, because they did get a basic site survey. So mm-hmm. you can get like a location kind of sketch for the three, 400 bucks or and, whatever. And that'll get Maryland. you really close. And that'll get, get you, get you close, really close, right? A plus or minus, but it's nothing yeah. you can go with. And it depends on the size of the property too. Right. Because if you're buying 10 acres, it may not yeah. you know, be something that you can use. Um, or that you want to pay for. But surveys are very costly. It can take thousands of dollars. It could be $25,000 to survey a property, and it could take six months or longer to actually get it done. By the time, I mean, surveyors are busy. I mean, I just had one done, twenty eight, a partial 20 acre, and it took almost six months, um, and it was $24,000. So when a buyer's buying a house, and they, they don't really know these things that could be on their property. The deal that I'm talking about with was that my sellers had a pool house that was constructed years and years ago. We don't even know when, right? But it was a substantial amount of the pool houses on the neighbor's property, Yes, right? So we were trying to get the neighbor because they were selling, right? Mm -hmm. There was a son or a guy that bought it or something and he wanted to develop it into lots. And though it wouldn't have cost him anything, we were going to, my sellers are going to pay to have it done but we wanted to do a lot line adjustment just relieving that encroachment uh, but the seller of the other neighboring property the one that we were encroaching on didn't want to do that right. and you actually did something to make it happen but the buyers had to be okay with it right yeah so i think yeah explain- i think we did a i think we did an easement that ex- but i think the easement um expires in a certain period of time might have been a 10 or 15 year easement but but nevertheless the buyers of this property could have had to tear that building down move they were buying it with the understanding that that seller could have forced them to remove that property absolutely right so how does a buyer protect themselves against this well i mean in in your situation you know thank god they got the survey uh because you don't you don't really know the problem without the survey it's not always apparent to the to the eye so yeah you there's a couple different ways a lot line would have been the the most protection the buyer would have an easement works great i think that easement that we did expires but it gives them time to do two things a renegotiate with the new owner of that property because that was going to change hands too which i believe was the reluctancy of the seller to do anything more that's exactly right. Yeah, they didn't want to. And then the second thing I think, if I remember, the, the the building wasn't in great shape, 
So I think they were going to renovate it, and they could bring it up to standards when they renovate it five, six, seven years down the road. So I think that was the the solution. But it just requires, hey, like anything else, communication. But without the survey, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And 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 I would say this: a lot of times we're asked, should you buy a survey? If you have what's known as a lot and block legal description where a, lo- a builder developed it and there was inspections with setback lines and inspections when foundations went in and those kind of things, you may, may not need a formal survey when you're buying. You're going to need it if you improve it. But if you have a meets and bounds description, right, or you're buying raw land or you know you're going to demo this house and or expand this property, you 100% need that survey when you're buying. You're going to need it when you permit the project. You may as well get it now to identify the problems instead of spending the money to buy the property. Get the survey when you're permitting it and find out you can't put a 20 by 30 pool, the swimming pool that you want there. Can't do it. Yeah. You're in, you're in, you're in the utility easement or whatever the, the issue would be. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, if you don't know where they are. One of the things that I want to talk about, which uh, – I had a client that was directly uh, impacted by this is that, you know, a lot of people buy these houses that are in a, you know, a small, maybe subdivision, maybe it's just two houses or three houses. And there was no actual road that was put in. It was a driveway and it is, you know, what's called the servient tenement, which is the one that's all the way, usually the farthest back. Yeah. Right. And so in this case, the buyers were the servient tenement. They were the ones that bought the house all the way in the back. And they didn't realize that when they bought it, that the other people that lived off of this driveway had the mm-hmm. disrupted right to sure. use that driveway, right? Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, and and the problems that came along with that were that there was a, um, a maintenance agreement for the driveway, right? Where it talked about how, you know, the people living off this driveway should have to contribute mm-hmm. to the repaving or plowing or what, you know, snow plowing or whatever was done. But the interesting thing was that as the buyer found out about this, as a result by this big party that um, this one neighbor had. And all of a sudden they went to leave their house and the driveway was just full of cars and packed and everything else. And this person tried to throw everybody off the property and block the driveway and things like that. And then they realized when the neighbor uh, was threatening to sue them, if they ever did anything like that again, that they in fact couldn't do it. Right. And this, this particular case even that neighbor had a way of accessing their drive driveway, not just through this piece that was owned by the the one all the way at the end. You know, what about something like that? I mean, I mean, do you guys let people know, sit down with them, and say, "Hey, by the way, there's a driveway agreement here. Um, you know, you're responsible for everything. You know, you're responsible for sixty percent, seventy percent." You know, these other people are responsible for when it comes time to paving or plowing or maintenance. I mean, how do you handle that? We, we would, if we see that in our title, we would normally copy and paste the document and send them an email saying, just want to, this is a, a little out of the ordinary. Just want to make sure you know. Who do you send that to? Send it to the buyer. But isn't it almost too late at that point? I mean, at what point down the road after they signed a contract? I mean, aren't you ready to sit down at the table? Yeah, so it's interesting. Well, it, in our situation, we're trying to get everything out within five or 10 days. So you normally have 10 or so, 10 to 20 days before the closing. But, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the fact that there was a shared driveway was probably apparent when they went to look at the house. Now, the rights of who pays for what and how it's administrated probably wasn't apparent, but the fact that it was there was apparent. So is that the agent's responsibility to know? It's hard. I mean, we try to tell our agents if you see, you know, the the lenders are always going to mandate there's a maintenance agreement on a shared driveway. And to your point, the counties normally would only let you develop property that way. If they're out of necessity, if the only not the landlock, the other seven or eight uh, houses on the cul-de-sac, so to speak, if they have access a different way, you shouldn't really the counties really frown on frown on shared driveway agreements if there's access other ways. Counties are getting much stricter, as you know, but also more aware of these issues. Uh, but in that situation, the, the buyer, if they if they look at the title commitment and ask us to take it through, you know, take it through with them. 
that's where that would have come out as an exception to the title policy. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Rights of others in the common driveway. Yeah. Do you have any nightmare stories of uh, title issues? One that pops to the mind that I mean, you know, maybe we've been, even you did. We, we've been lucky. Um, we've been able to get them all to the table. Uh, you know, I look at insurance. It's really weighing risk and reward and trying to mitigate the risk. So we've been in my 32 year career. We've always gotten them to the table. A lot of it just really requires a little bit of negotiation between the party. Then how do you minimize the risk? What's the most likely outcome? How do you minimize the risk? So uh, we've been fortunate, but things come up. You know, it, it's probably, I, I like to have a, ask my processors and paralegals would probably tell you, 85 to 90% of the transactions we have, there is some title issue that's resolved. Sometimes it's done behind the scenes. Sometimes it's done with affidavits at closing, those types of things. But the, the problems do come up. Well, finally, let's talk about title. Because, you know, a lot of people don't know how they should title a property. What are the different kinds of ways that somebody can title a property? And, you know, what is the best way? I mean, what do you recommend typically? Well, certainly in Maryland now and in and, and the Northeast states where we do a lot of our work, if you're a married couple or a domestic partnership, you should use the tenant by the entirety uh, classification because it protects the creditors of one person cannot put the lien against the property of both. So the tenant by the entirety uh, classification, and it gives you a right of survivorship if God forbid one were to die, the second one owns it completely. Joint tenant gives you that protection too. There is a right of survivorship with joint tenants. The problem with joint tenants is if one person files bankruptcy or one person conveys a mortgage somehow, they shouldn't be allowed to do it, but if they do it, it severs the tenancy and it converts it to tenants in common, which puts it at risk to the For creditors. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some people will hold tenants in common and they'll do a tenant in common agreement or a joint venture agreement as to profits and those types of things. But the tenant in common is risky because if you and I own tenants in common and my business goes bad and I get judgments against me individually, it's going to levy that property. And if, if, if my liens go above the value, we're now in a negotiation about how to get that property out of the, the, the impact of the liens. So it adds complications to it. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, you can always use, you know, investors use LLCs all the time. Trust uh, for the right um, family situation, a trust is perfect. Can, yeah. can you talk about that? I mean, when is the perfect situation for trust? I think it's, I think it's when the kids are grown and you're going to use it as a will substitute or you have a, a, a child that maybe is a, has a special need of some type. Uh, either um, um, emotionally or physically or whatever, then you can have that property either put into trust now, and when you pass away, there's an independent trustee appointed that follows your wishes to administrate that property and protect the interest of your children that have the needs to do it. Or you just use it as a will substitute. You don't have to probate. It just follows the trust document and goes right to the children. So I think as you get now... If you're younger and the kids are younger and you're going to borrow against it a couple times, the lenders are not, they're a little skeptical of the trust. So a lot of times you get a higher rate where you have to, you don't have as many lenders to, to price kind of a thing. So I, I tend to only want the trust to be enacted a little bit further down the road. That's good advice. Dave, uh, I said that was the last thing, but I do have one uh, final thought that just came to me because, you know, there's a lot going on in the world of real estate and uh, real estate agents, you know, in many ways um, with lawsuits that are going on uh, will probably become less and less. I don't think we're everybody will say in a couple of years that they know five agents or five real estate agents or more um, or that, and you know, that they know somebody who is an agent. That is typically how you get your business is you, you know, an agent refers clients to you because, like I said earlier, they don't know what title is buyers usually and or a title company that they would use. Are you thinking that it's important for your business? Do you think that there will be more agent less transactions moving forward if you had to, you know, um, hold everybody's ears that gives you business that are agents that i mean do you see where there will be a growing demand 
of people just coming to you saying, hey, Dave, th- I'm the seller and I'm the buyer and we want to buy this together. Help us buy it. I don't think significantly. I, I do think that you see more off market transactions now because I just think that the supply is so low that a lot of houses are staying in the family or family and friends or those kind of things. As far as the disruption of the market, even though there's information on the internet, you know, we can all go to certain websites and see a certain house and those kind of things. You know, the agents are the great facilitators of the transactions. And, you know, if you think about what makes what we do difficult is we have to know a, a lot about a lot of different parts of the law to make the title work. What makes an agent, especially a great agent, stand out is that they understand the whole transaction. Not just are you getting a good value. They understand why you should only post a certain deposit. They understand what the damage clauses say. They understand how the, to get the inspection fixed so the lender will lend on the property, right? There's all these things you, you guys do behind the scenes that make these things work. So to say that we're going to have less realtors, I don't think so. I think the, I think the in any profession, the cream rises to the crop. I think that the, you'll you'll see less part-time realtors because the volume's down. But the need for an experienced realtor, I think, is always going to be there, and the consumer should have that. That service. Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I would love to be in business 10 years from now as a real estate broker. Todd did not pay me for that comment, by the way. <laughs> That's right. You know, I, look, I tell you what, though, I think a lot of my fellow uh, agents and brokers out there would like to see a huge reduction in the amount of agents that are out there because there are agents that shouldn't be agents and there are probably brokers that shouldn't be brokers too, but... Very few people can do anything part-time and be good at it. That's true. You know, the re- I, I get calls all the time for, for litigation matters, which I refer out because we're a transactional law practice. I cannot be in court for two weeks and not getting transactions to the table. It's not fair to people. And I think that, you know, you, you can't be part, to me, you can't be part-time and be good at something. Very few people, I should say, can be part-time and be good at something. Amen to that. Yeah. Well, look, man, we really appreciate your time. And yeah. as uh, you guys may have noticed, if you pay attention to our channel, this isn't the first time that Dave Thurston has been on the show. Uh, he has been a regular contributor. And as you can see why uh, from uh, his his experience and uh, knowledge in the industry, as always, we love to read your comments. I'm sure if you have a question for David, you could just post it below. Uh, and we'll if he doesn't see it, we'll make sure he does. And you can reach out to him as well. All of his links are in the show notes. Real estate is a contact sport, Todd. So that, we're here to help. That's right. That's right. So we'll see you next time. Thanks. All right, guys. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed meeting David Thurston. And if you did, you can let us know by smashing that thumbs up. It will also help the algorithm to share this video with more people. And you can also leave a comment as to what you thought of the video and what's happening in your town. And as always, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so now and smash that alert bell. You'll know every time I upload content just like this. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland broker number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.